That's the most important question. Which is what? What, the most important? What's the favorite kind of hamantaschen? Oh, mine? Yes. My favorite kind of hamantaschen? Uh, it's a tough question, but uh, my mom makes these delicious ones from um, canned um, cherries, oh. wild cherries. Oh. Oh, phew, I thought you said poppy seed. I was like, oh, no, no. no. Oh, she makes a really good one out of poppy seed, too. Um, I like those uh, oh. when she makes them. But uh, but uh, the, the cherry ones are my favorite that she makes. Anyway, yeah. I've never had a hamantasha that was as good as my mom's. Well, let's put it that oh, way. Oh, that's so nice. It's, it's, it's just, I can't believe I'm recording this. Yes, it's true. It's sorry, true. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I was, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean for it to be like something like that. I was just... Just trying to, just curious. All right. I'm going to ask uh, her for the recipe. I'm so sorry. Okay, no, no, no problem. Let's, let's, uh, let's get this uh, party started. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, Wait, it wasn't recorded then. Well, it was recorded on, uh, on Facebook. All right. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Where was I? All right, so uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, welcome everybody to the to the class. Parshat Pekude. First of all, Chodesh Tov. It is now the second uh, Adar. We had a, we had a first chance, kind of like a test run of Adar, and now this is the real thing. Uh, we we are doing real pace, uh, real real Purim now, uh, not Purim Katan, uh, real Shushan Purim, not Shushan Purim Katan, real Zion Adar, not Zion whatever. Anyway, so uh, it's it's all good. Um, Baruch Hashem, we are, uh, we're getting places. Now, um, I would like to, if possible, uh, dedicate today's class to, um, to Fur Shalima for Sara Ora uh, Batraya, uh, my mother-in-law, and uh, she should have a Fur Shalima, and everybody should hear only good news and only good things. Um, the schut of learning Torah is a very powerful schut, almost as powerful probably even more powerful than the, the, the in almost any other mitzvah you can think of as uh, as Gamora explains in several places so uh let's talk about pikude um this is the end of sefer shemot we're going to say chazak chazak this shabbat and uh we're going to finish shemot and as we know shemot is a sefer it's somehow a uh, a unified unit <laughs> and so uh the this is why uh the ramban writes that it's a safer geula it is the the uh, the book of our of our um rescue of our deliverance and you might think as many people do that the story of the ten the the, the story of the exodus from egypt ended at the Har Sinai, or ended when we got the Ten Commandments, or something like that. Says, says Ramban, if that were true, then the Sefer would have ended there, and Vayikra would have started the building of the Mishkan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the building of the Mishkan is somehow very, very crucial, central to the whole idea of Geula. The building of the Mishkan is somehow the really the crux of it all, the, the main point, what, what it's all about. In his introduction to Shemot, Ramban writes that indeed uh, the really Geula is only achieved when we are uh, when we've when we've brought down the Shechina to rest in our midst. So that does not happen until this week's parsha. That's right. Only now, only in Shemot, only in Pekude, do we finally have. The ending of Shemot, where the Shechina rests among us, and we're so holy, we're so great that the Shechina dwells among us, and that's what makes it so that um, so that the uh, we are really free. Freedom isn't just being able to do whatever you want. Freedom is the ability to grow spiritually, to have spiritual freedom, to, uh, to know you're doing the right thing. You, you feel. When, after you've done the after you've done a good thing, you've probably experienced this. You feel like ah, I feel like I've done something. I've achieved something. I've I've grown somehow, and that's exactly the uh, the, the this feeling of geula that the Ramban says we're supposed to feel when we finish Sefer Shemot, which happens in this week's parsha with uh, with the conclusion of Pekude. So, 
uh, most of the parsha, at least the first like three or four uh, aliyot, uh, aliyot are uh, mostly about an accounting. It's a very incomplete accounting, as we'll we'll discuss uh, in in some measure uh, in uh, in some of the commentaries we'll see today. But uh, but there are other commentaries we're not going to that we're not going to see. I, I very much wanted to include uh, some some thoughts of Rav Hirsch uh, tonight, but uh, we're going to try to save that for next year, God willing. He's, he's, he has a whole thesis that he runs through the entire uh, first half of the parsha that basically talks about why the accounting isn't really an accounting. It's more of a measure of how great we've become more than what we're using. And his main proof, by the way, in case you're curious, is the fact that uh, if you look at the psukim themselves, it doesn't really talk very much in the very beginning about what everything is used for. It says some of the things, some gold, some silver. It doesn't really, it doesn't really go into great detail about a lot of things that it should have if what we're looking for in accounting. But before we get too far into that, and definitely, uh, like I said, want to save that for next year, Let's look at some of the other classic commentaries and see how they understood this very important Parsha. I'm going to go in a deep dive, uh, sharing the uh, source sheet that uh, is available to you anytime you want in Safaria. It's the YISD 0211. That's the second book. That's Shemot 11. That's 11th Parsha. 5782. That's the year. And, um, and yeah. Let's, uh, let's see what it says. So, um, Shemot, Lamed Chet, Chaf Aleph. Lamed Chet, Chaf Aleph um, is, uh, right? Just give me a moment here to find it in my book. Uh, it is the first Pasuk in Pekude. It's kind of interesting, again, we we've note that we note this sometimes, but it's it's worth repeating. Uh, it's chapter thirty eight, verse 20, 21. Why are we starting here? Why don't we start in chapter you know verse one, thirty eight one or thirty nine one? Why why are we starting in twenty one? And the answer, part of the answer, is that the uh, the chapters and verses are not of Judaic source, right? The uh, the people who made these chapters and verses were actually Christian monks. Who, uh, for their uh, copying purposes, needed to keep things in a sort of organized way to know where they stopped, where to start, that sort of thing, and so they they made up the chapters and verses. That doesn't mean that they, they changed the content in any way. They did not, but they did uh, they did assign numbers to these things, uh, which we did not have. And uh, in fact, there are many many Torah commentaries you'll see where they refuse to use these kinds of numbers. So they'll say something like, uh, Parsha Pekude for Thalia. So, yeah, you, you kind of have to look through the Chumash until you find, uh, say, Parsha Pekude, which, of course, also the monks did not have. They did not have the names of the Parshiot. Or actually, they're, they're called Sidrot. And... Um, and they also didn't have uh, our, our Aliyah system. So they, they, they didn't follow that at all. Although that would have been a, a good enough system. Uh, it seems to work for many Jewish forum, uh, many commentaries, Sfat Emet and others. Um, the Orgidal Yahu often uh, doesn't really use chapter and verse the way, um, the way that the Christians uh, would have wanted. All right. Anyway, so, uh, so here we have Eilip Kudeha Mishkan. This is the recording. This is the accounting pikude of the Mishkan. So again, I'm not going to get into it, but Rav Hirsch has a problem with the word pikude because pikude almost always refers to people, not to things. So it's a very strange thing. But anyway, Ela pikude ha Mishkan, Mishkan ha Edut. This is the tabernacle of the Edut of the gathering. Asher pukad al pi Moshe that was uh, made, which is accounted for by Moshe, by his word. Avodat Halavim, it was the work of the Levium. Uh, so this, this accounting seems to have been the job of the Levium to, to count the actual vessels. Okay, Biyad. I took it away. Sorry? Oh, okay. Uh, so Biyad, uh, by the, so the, the, the Levi who was, um, the Levi who was uh, mostly in charge of this accounting was somebody by the name of Itamar. Um, 
ben Aaron HaKohen, right? The son of Aaron, Itamar, was, uh, was, was commanded the Levium to do the proper accounting of these things that were used for the Mishkan. That's, that's the possible. So we have a number of questions on this, a number of questions. Um, first off, we're going to see from the Or Chaim, HaKadosh, of Chaim ben Atar, of Moroccan descent, not just descent, but that's where he's from. <laughs> uh, so, so it says the, um, so, so he, so he has a question. The, what, what are we accounting for here? What is the, what is the point of this accounting? Did the Jewish people not trust Moshe? Is, you know, what's, what, what, what's, what's happening here? And really the main question is, uh, why was there a need for an accounting? Like, who's, who's, who ordered it? it? Sounds like Moshe ordered it. Why? So it says the Orachai Makadosh. He says, and this is a, a little bit further on in his, uh, in his comment. It's about halfway through his comment. Actually, about a third. Oh, it's, a, it's a long comment. Never mind. It's, uh, it's, it's about a, like a fifth of the way down. If in case you're uh, looking for it, Od Yitzah al Zaderach liyot shemosha asa hamispar liyisrael muva beit Hashem lezeh ba hatora it's diku v'amra elapukade etc. In other words, the point of this pasuk is to teach us along the lines of what the sages said. What did they say? Uh, sorry, uh, I'm not in the right place. Uh, okay, so again, um, so going to these lines, uh, so, so since Moshe was alone uh, and he counted all of the valuables that Israel, that the Jewish people brought for the sake of this Mishkan, so there was a concern that perhaps people might suspect him. There's talk about what he wore. We'll get to that in, uh, in Vayikra, etc., what, what the, he wore clothes that were, it was very clear. They didn't pocket anything while he was doing the avoda, right? So you have to be completely, completely above board in all of these types of situations. That's why the Torah comes along to show his dikato, his, his, how, how, what, a, what kind of a tzaddik he was, and how, how righteous he was, how honest he was, right? So it's, uh, as it says later on, perish al Derech Omru, this is the same as our explanation in Vayikra 23 2, which says, Elehem Moadai. Right? These are the counts, meaning the true, these are the of the festivals. This is this is uh, the, the real ones, this is the real number. In other words, Alpi Moshe. Let's get down to there to the, the dark part here, three lines from the bottom. Alpi Moshe, Lo Amar Shepakad Moshe doesn't say. That, that Moshe counted, Hatam Kilo Hayal Hazolat Imo Hit Tadak Ele Mepiv Anuchayen Sheken Ktiv Vikulifne Moshe Shahu Levado Lakahako. It was Moshe himself who made all of this necessary. In other words, he got all these donations and he thought, well, you know. I know I'm not misusing these donations. I know this is the right thing to do. I know I'm not doing anything wrong, but I want the Jewish people to know that. I want it to be abundantly clear, 100% that, that I had nothing to do with anything illegal in all of the workings here. Every single, absolutely every single thing is accounted for, every single piece of silver, every single grain of gold, everything is accounted for. And it, I'm, my hands are clean, and I want everybody to know that. The relevance to us is, is, is unimaginable. We have over and over and over again, unfortunately, throughout Jewish history, this has happened, where human beings who are fallible, they, we, we make mistakes, and even leaders and even people in powerful positions make mistakes, and they're, they're sometimes not held accountable and then bad things happen, and we wonder why. It's because 
from the get-go, at every single opportunity, there needs to be this clarkite. It needs to be completely honest, completely clear that everybody is on, you know, everything is completely above board. Nobody's trying to do any tricks. Nobody's trying to, you know, do anything uh, selfish or, or uh, abuse their power in any way. Everything has to be completely, it has to be an open book. It has to be complete transparency, as a previous uh, American administration used to talk about, at least talk about. So there needs to be complete transparency. There, has, there can't be any Shilas. There can't be any questions. I mean, not that there can't be people asking questions. There shouldn't be any reason to give, to give people to ask these questions. Everything should be completely uh, exposed and un, uh, completely no secrecy at all about what is being done with what and by whom. The more we do that, the more honest we are, the, the more we can have these kinds of conversations. And we don't have to worry about some of the things that, that have happened uh, in, in Jewish communities where, uh, where power has been abused. But there's other answers. There are other answers to, to this accounting. And uh, one has to do with the Midrash that you probably uh, are unfamiliar with at this point. But it's quoted by the Chidusha Harim. The Chidusha Arim, one of the Ger Rebbes, at uh, the Chidusha Harim, writes, so there's a Midrash, Itav a Midrash, Amar Moshe Ribon HaOlam, Master of the Universe, Asinat Malachat HaMishkan, we did the whole Mishkan, we, we built everything we needed to do, with Haranu, and then there's Hotel, there's more, we have, we have extra. Manasa Benota, what, we, what should we do with what's extra? This is a Midrash, so don't take it literally. So Amar Lo, he's, so Hashem answers him, Lecha, it's for you. Mishkan So make a, basically make a Mishkan of testimony. Make another, another Mishkan. We, you made a Mishkan, and with the extras, make another Mishkan. What? Make another Mishkan? When, when, when it said that we, uh, we did everything we could do, that it was completed, there was extra. So what does this mean? So again, the, the Midrash, it is in Shemot Rabbah 51, if you want to look it up. Basically, Hashem is saying, you have this extra material to build the, the you built the Mishkan and you've got extra material. Build another Mishkan. What does that mean? So the way the Chidush Arim explains this midrash is like this. Hashem is saying that just the same way, just the same enthusiasm, just the same attitude, just the same honesty that you had when you built this Mishkan, use that for more. Keep doing that. This the string It's it still belongs to you. To you. Make with that. Make that. Use that enthusiasm for the rest of your life. That zeal, that generosity, all of it means that the shechina is going to rest here. That's what, the, that's what the Jewish people were able to, to create. They were able to create a physical space for this Hashem's spiritual power, presence, to be on this earth. That same enthusiasm, that same honesty, that same generosity, and everything else that they put into it, we can now put into other things. We can expand how much we feel Hashem's presence. It doesn't, it's not just limited to the Mishkan. And we know that's historically true because the Mishkan at some point ended and we still had some sort of power to build the Beit HaMikdash and later build the Beit HaMikdash Shani. And they say that the, the Gemara says that Shekhinah is still there in that spot in Yerushalayim on the top of Haramuria where the Beit HaMikdash was. The Shekhinah is still there. Right? And Harabayat. It's still there. Why? Because we brought it down with our human and our, our human spirituality. 
our human generosity, our human uh, enthusiasm. That's what brought down the Shechina. And that Shechina is still here. That's what it means that build another Mishkan. Now, you can do other things now. That extra that the Jewish people brought, that extra is still here also. And the results of it, the, the effects of it, are still, uh, can still be felt. Beautiful idea, I think, as we go into a new month of, of Adar, that, uh, you, you know, you, you think Mishinichnas Adar Marbim Simcha, we're supposed to increase our joy. How do you increase joy? By realizing how much spirituality we have. You know, we have so much. We can bring down so much holiness. We can do so much with, with our limited human power, what we think is limited. There's so much we could do. So that, that's still able to be done. That's, that, that's what Hashem is saying. Build another Mishkan. Go ahead. You can. You know why? Because you have that power. It's a, I think a, a beautiful idea now. I was inspired by it. Anyway, uh, adds the uh, and, and next question we can still ask on this verse. Another question we can ask. This is, this is an interesting word that's used. Um, not, not just the word, but it's spelling. Ha'edut. Right? So the word edut means uh, testimony. And here the verse again says, uh, mishkan, mishkan ha and it's a four letter word hey ayin dalad tat tough right so uh, so you have these four words usually a dude has a yud after the ayin should be a five letter word so what's going on where's where 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 does this yud go so listen to this beautiful khatam sofer so he says Uh, he says, well, let's find it here. There we go. Mishkan, Mishkan Haidut, Ita Rabbeinu Bachai. So he's quoting a Rabbeinu Bachai. A Mishkan, Im Hashem, Im Hei Otiot. It should have uh, four letters, five letters. Shalha Mishkan, Begematria, Taf Chaf. Taf Chaf. Taf Chaf is 420. So if it has those five letters, it has a gematria of 520. What does that mean? shamad bayacheni. That's the same amount of time that the bayacheni, that that descendant, let's call it spiritual descendant of the Mishkan, the Beit Hamigdash, the second Beit Hamigdash, right, uh, stood for 420 years. So that's referenced by these words ha edut, right, without the vav. By the way, we can do the gematria real quick uh, if you like. If I can find the pasuk, here we go. Ha'idut, right? Is hey? That's five. Uh, ayin is seventy. All right. So wait, hold on a second. So what are we doing? Uh, so yeah. So a dude without the uh, if it would have had a yud, a dude would have been four hundred twenty, right? Ayin is seventy. Hold on. 70. 70. Uh -huh. That's not right. So how is he how is he doing this? Um give me a second. Uh oh wait. Sorry. So he says the Gematri of Hamishkan, not ha a dude. Hamishkan. Let's go back to the Khatam Sofer. I'm saying this wrong. One moment. Here we are. Uh, Hamishkan. Ah, there you go. <laughs> I have to read more carefully. Hamishkan im he otiot shall Hamishkan gematria tavchaf. So Mishkan is five plus forty plus three hundred plus twenty plus fifty. So the, uh, that comes out to uh, to four twenty. Minus five, right? So it lacks five uh, for the total of 420. Um, so that means that there's five letters of the word. So there's five more letters. Uh, right. So Mishkan Begematria Tuf Yud. The word Mishkan without the hay is a Gematria 410, right? Um, 
410. Just the Rishon. The first Beit Hamikdash stood for 410 years. Ha'edut chaser vav. Ha'edut without the vav, not the yud. Vav is begematria tough ayin tet, which is 479. Kmis amar hamishkan. That's how long the Mishkan stood. The Mishkan stood longer than the Beit Hamikdash first one or second one, right? By uh, by by good 50, uh, 50, 59 years or so, or thirty nine years, uh, forty nine years and thirty nine years. All right. Anyway, <laughs> math is not my strong point. Shamar Mishkan Ad Binyan Abayit until the Beit Hamikdash was built. Shuhu Davar Nifla. This is an amazing thing. Ella Shetarach Lamar Mem Ted Chasar Hey. So. 49 minus 5 mispar by cheni i should tarikh le tarif asham otiot the mispar tof khaf the tarikh limud hel remes khamisha devarim she khasru by cheni mavar so it says the adds the khatam sofer so that was all most of that was rabino bakhai so now it says the khatam sofer we're going to quote him later for another thing but the khatam sofer says so why is this missing five what's this five that we're missing that doesn't make sense uh, it's 420 minus five, right? So we still have these five we got to deal with. So what's five? Five happens to be a very important number when it comes to the Beit HaMikdash. The Beit HaMikdash, especially the second one, was missing five major things that the first Beit HaMikdash had. The, the Mishnah says in Pekei Avot that the, uh, the, Beit, the, the, Beit, the, Beit, the Beit HaMikdash, the second one, didn't have a heavenly fire that was going onto the Mizbech from heaven, from Shemaim. There was a fire that would go down. The second Beit HaMikdash did not have that. It did not have the Shekhinah, not in the same way anyway, although we said already that the Shekhinah is still there. So during the time of the Beit HaMikdash, the second one, it wasn't as felt as it was before. Ruach HaKodesh, there was no prophecy. Prophecy was, uh, was pretty much ended during the time of the second Beit HaMikdash. And the Urim Vitumim, this uh, secret little... Uh, uh, folded, uh, you know, parchment that, that was inside the breastplate of the coin gadol. So that too did not exist. It was it was no longer available during the second Beit Hamikdash. So five things. That's why the gematria of Mishkan Hamishkan is 420 minus five. Right? It's the 420 years missing those five ingredients. That's the Khatam Sofer. In other words. In other words, I just want to make this very clear. Nothing the Khatam Sofer is, is saying uh, really um, is really new. Right? Like I said, it's it's quoted. He's not he's not saying something about the Beit Hamikdash that nobody ever knew before. Right? This is from a Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, or at least a Midrash. Right? So, so it's definitely in the Gemara. So it's definitely a well known idea that it's missing five things. What's so what's new about what the Khatam Sofer is adding? He's explaining why these particular words are spelled this particular way in the Torah. Because it's most important, and I keep trying to emphasize this in as many classes as possible without just uh, you know, uh, beating a dead horse about it. Uh, the, pardon the expression. But the, the most important thing to understand about learning Torah is that there are hints and codes and all kinds of deeper and deeper learnings that can be found in the original text. In the original text, because the original text that we have today is exactly the same one that we had before. It has not changed. It's, by the way, historically very strange, very strange, except for actual ancient documents that we find that we don't have new copies of. So, so obviously the, the new version is, is the same as the old version. Any old book, even uh, you know, even Shakespeare, which was written in the late 1500s, early 1600s. So it's not that old. It's like 400 years old. Even Shakespeare, there's different versions. There's the Folger edition and the this edition and that edition, right? And there's all kinds of different uh, the Riverside edition, all kinds of different opinions about what, what which which folio, the first folio, second folio, who's 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 is right, who's is wrong. Did Shakespeare write any of this? All of it? Some of it? We don't know, right? And that's only 400 years ago. We're talking about the Torah, which is 3,000 years ago. 
And we know exactly word for word exactly what was written in it because nothing has changed. Every ancient manuscript we find of the Torah is exactly the same, except for those written by other sects of Judaism, the Essenes, etc. That's going to get a little complicated. I'm not going to get into all that now. But uh, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls, etc. But any Mesorah that we have is, is, is intact. And there's a reason for that. It's so that the Khatam Sofer and others could look at a word like Mishkan and say, oh, it's, the, it's this gematria. And this gematria matches up with this idea about the Mishkan that we already know. So it's, it's a good little hint. So these hints are important for, amongst other reasons, to build our imuna and our faith in the fact that the Torah was written by Hashem. It has a goal in mind and we are part of that goal it's very important and that's if if there's any other if there's no other reason to learn torah it's it should be for this to have the to have this confidence that it was written by hashem it was written by a godly source and it was given to us and it has never been changed these are very important fundamentals of amuna that the rambam writes about all right, let's uh, let's continue. Uh, so that was uh, the first verse. <laughs> then comes along uh, chapter thirty nine, verse thirty two. So much of the rest of chapter thirty eight is literally accounting. There's this many pounds of this. This many. Okay, I didn't say pounds. All right, this many. <laughs> this many amot of that. This many uh, kav of this. And it goes on and on like that. And of course, like I said, there's a lot of depth in it, if, but we have to like look into it. We can't just, you know, read it out in, in English. We need to see what it says in the original text. So all the way in the third aliyah, the end of the, towards the, uh, is it towards the end? Uh, no. Yeah. Hold on. 39, 32. Yeah. Towards the, the very last verse in the third aliyah. It says, "Vatechel kol avodat mishkan ohel moed v'asu bnei Yisrael kechol asher tziva Hashem et Moshe kain asu." So finally, the tabernacle, the whole mishkan, was done. The tent of uh, meeting. The Jews did everything they were supposed to do, just as Hashem had commanded Moshe. So did they do. Kain asu. And we talked about this last year as well. It's a very interesting last part of the phrase here. Right, Moshe should be enough. The Jewish people did everything that Hashem told Moshe. So then there's that last two words there, Cain Asu. So they did. It's a little strange, right? It doesn't seem to have any uh, obvious purpose. And that's when you have to look into it a little more deeply, as we shall by first quoting the Psikta Rabati. That's a Midrash, Psikta Rabati 2.1. And it starts by uh, quoting a verse that we say every morning in davening. Mizmur Shir Hanukkah Tabayit LeDavid. Right? And uh, the, the very first thing we say in Psikta de Zimra. Or, uh, you know, Ashkenazim say. The <laughs> first thing Ashkenazim say. Uh, it's like uh, not the first thing I think that everybody else says. But whatever. Um, the, uh, so it says here. I'm trying to find the actual text. Uh, uh, Esther. Sheet. Where are we? Uh, give me a moment. Psikta Rabati is, a, is, uh, is, not a, um, is not a text that's easy to navigate. It, it quotes from all over the place. And uh, uh, let's see if I can find it. I, I, I can say this out, uh, you know, I can say this out without the text, but I think. Uh, it's beneficial to see the text inside, if I can find it, which is not looking good right now. Um, okay. Well, uh, so in the Psikta, it says, 
that on the 25th day of Kisav, when do we say Hanukkah the Bait David? On um, Hanukkah, right? It was the inauguration of the Mishkan when? So it was finished on the 25th of Kislev, which is also the first day of Hanukkah. That's when the Mishkan was completed, but it wasn't put together until the first day of Nisan. One month from now, on the first day of Nisan, that's when we start celebrating the putting together of the Mishkan. Right? So, um, based on that, By the way, and I, I, we've mentioned this Hanukkah time, but it's, it's, worth, uh, it's worth reminding everybody. Um, the fact that uh, we celebrate Hanukkah on the 25th of Kislev isn't just because the, the Jews fought off the, the Syrian Greeks and got to the Beit HaMikdash and found the jug of oil, right? That's not the only reason why we celebrate that on the 25th of Kislev. The most amazing thing is that that event, that very event, happened on the exact same day that the Mishkan was completed, the 25th of Kislev, that same exact date. And the Jews at the time knew that, right? They said, wait a minute, what day is it today? Well, they looked at their, you know, their watch, and okay, they didn't have a watch, right? So they, they looked at the, the sun and the, the moon, whatever, and they said, whoa, it's the 25th of Kislev. It's, it's Hanukkah time. Hanukkah time is Be'ach. The Mishkan was finished now. And they're like, wow, we, what we're doing now has some sort of resonance to that event. Or that event has some resonance now. Right? It, it, it's, it's all part of the same event. It, just like we said before. In other words, the, 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 the Jewish people, when they built the Mishkan, they put so much into it that there was more to give. There was more to do. And that continues and that reverberates. And every single Hanukkah and every single time we talk about the Mishkan, learn about the Mishkan, something happens in the world. It becomes a holier place. Who knows? Maybe uh, if we keep learning Torah strongly enough, enthusiastically enough, maybe this would end wars in the world. God willing. You know? Who knows? All right. So that's the uh, Psikta talks about when Hanukkah was started, etc. Uh, but we're, uh, we're, we're not on that. I want to show you a balaturim on this verse. Right? That, that same phrase. And they completed all the work of the, of the Mishkan. They finished this on the 25th of Kislev. Sorry, Begematria. Uh, the Gematria of this phrase, the Techel Kol Avodat Mishkan. I'm not going to do the math for you, but if you, unless you really want, so six plus 400 plus 20 plus 30 plus 20 plus 30 plus 70 plus 2 plus 4 plus 400 plus 40 plus 300 plus 20 plus 50 is the same Gematria, is the Esrim Uchamisha Bekislev Nigmar. It was completed on the 25th of Kislev. Now, so this, this psikta, right, this, this, uh, this midrash and the Gemaras and everything else that say that, 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 uh, that the, that the uh, Mishkan was completed on 25th of Kislev, they don't actually have a source in the Torah for that. The Torah doesn't say what day of the, of the week it was done. But it happens to be it, it was done on this particular day, on the 25th of Kislev. You could do the math. Rashi does the math. He figures it out for you. But it doesn't actually say it out, you know, doesn't say it out explicitly. But here we have the gematria of this phrase is it was done on the 25th of Kislev. In other words, the first day of Hanukkah. In other words, Hanukkah is not just a random holiday. that just happened on a particular day. Because it happened on this day, because the Syrian Greeks were kicked out of the Beit HaMikdash and the Kohanim were able to come in and get that oil and start lighting the menorah on the 25th of Kislev, it fit with this event. This event, this, this event sent shockwaves through history that were able to be captured by the Hashmonaim in the time of Hanukkah, and they were able to bait, build the Beit HaMikdash uh, or fix up the Beit HaMikdash at that point, rededicate it. Is a good way to put it. Oh, okay. Well then, okay. Um, next, next point. 
Uh, why does the Torah repeat this phrase? As we said before, uh, it's a very, uh, even before the strange phrase as Cain Asu, which we talked about in previous years, the, just the phrase that the, the, the Jewish people did, uh, what is the point of that phrase? So the Beit HaLevi, which by the way, as, uh, as I've mentioned in previous years, previous classes, the Beit HaLevi uh, wrote his commentary on the Torah and it, it was, it's incomplete. He passed away before he finished it, and he uh, he actually ended before uh, Pekude. So this week's parsha Pekude does not have a Beit Halevi on this parsha, but he has something that he wrote earlier in Kitis to be specific. He wrote this very important idea. Let's see if I can find it here, yeah. Um, very important idea here. And that is that uh, good. Navin Mash Parshat Bekude, and this uh, this this idea that he was writing about, we're not going to get into it right now, as a reference to what it says in Pekude, which is what we're learning here. And it says, the Al Kol Prat Prat on each and every detail, the Al Masa Masa on every single action, Asu, the Mishkan, Katuv Muforash, Kasher Tziva Hashem. It says explicitly for every single action and for every single detail, as Hashem commanded. That phrase, Kasher Tziva Hashem, is written at Moshe, is written in all of these, uh, each detail, each spot. Why? Vatevat halalu and these words ktuvim kima at the kol pasuk and pasuk almost in every single verse shiba ota parsha in that in that whole parsha you look at parsha pekude over and over again kasher tzivah shemat moshe is written over and over and over again why is that? Rak ha'inyan de masa hamishkan harei ba lechaper alehem al masa ha'egel. So first of all, says the Beit Halevi and others say this as well. We have to remember that the building of the Mishkan had something to do with forgiving the Jewish people for the golden calf. Masa Ha'egel. Right? Ukumod the Itiba Midrash Raba, Pasha Vayakel, as it says in Pirsha Yak uh in the Midrash, it says, Khatu bin Zamim, Diktiv, Parku in his Nizme, Hazahav, the they they sinned with the with the gold. And it was with the same kind of jewelry, etc., and the gold and everything that they were able to get kapara, they were able to be forgiven. In other words, in English words, right? The Jewish people made the golden calf based on what? What command were they given to build the golden calf? I'll tell you what the command was. Nothing. Don't do it was the command. And they did it anyway. Why? Well, okay, so there's different opinions about what they were thinking, what their kavana was. Whatever it was, I've got three words for you. They were wrong. All of their chlachma, all of their ideas, all of their kavanot, all of their philosophy, and all of their, you know, all of their meditation and spiritual, whatever, however good the, uh, they thought the Masa Egel was, however bad some of them thought it was, they were all wrong. Uh, it was wrong. It was the wrong thing to do. Those people who thought it said it was wrong. The, the ones who did it were all wrong. Why? Because they use their own intellect. They use their own intelligence. They use their own kavana. Not kasher tziva Hashem at Moshe. Not Hashem commanded Moshe. So at every single step of the forgiveness process for the golden calf, at every single step, you need to be reminded that they're doing it just the way Hashem told Moshe to do it. Every single step. Every single action, every single piece of material was all exactly as Hashem commanded it, because that is what forgave the Jewish people. Their mistake was using their own chachma. Hashem has his chachma, and we have our own. We're, we're better. We know better. We, we created our own world. 
No, we're not. We have nothing compared to Hashem. Hashem knows everything. And as soon as you're able, the, the earliest opportunity you have of submitting yourself to Hashem's rule, say, okay, I, I don't know better than Hashem. Hashem said to do this. Okay, fine. I'll do it this. As soon as you do that, that's the beginning of the Kapara process. That's how you get forgiveness for what you've done in the past. Because whatever wrong you've done in the past was not because you were doing what Hashem told you to do. Because if you were, it wasn't wrong. That's how it works. It's only wrong because you were doing it from a completely different perspective. Every single detail, every single element of the Mishkan, everything was performed according to his, his kavana, Hashem's kavana, Hashem's intent, whatever that was. Right, and everybody was just subjugated under that. It says, you know, Hashem said to do this. Who am I? Who am I going to argue with? You know, it happens in life very often. You know, we have, you know, those of us who work for somebody else. Right, you have a boss, and your boss says, let's say, uh, let's let's pretend some of you have ever worked in a kitchen. I don't know if you have. I have. Right. So the the, the chef tells you to do uh, to do such and such. Do A B C. And you're doing it, you're in the process, you do, you've done A, you're about to do B, and you say, you know what? I can skip B. I can do C first and then B. I'll do A, C, B today. I know this sounds like, a, you know, it sounds like a Dr. Seuss poem, which is ironic because it's his, I think it's his birthday today. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> instead of A, B, C, I'm going to do A, C, B. I'm going to try this other way. You're doing something wrong. It might turn out, it might turn out even better. Your, your new recipe might have a new name. Right, uh, Rosenberg chicken or whatever. Right? So uh, you, you're gonna call it whatever you uh, whatever you know. You're gonna call it something new, but as long as you're working under somebody, you have to do what they said, unless it's wrong, right? And it's a, you know, you're a soldier and your uh, your officer tells you to uh, go kill innocent women and children. Okay, you you can obviously uh, you, sh you should probably ignore that order, but. Uh, as, as long as it's not something wrong, you have to listen to your boss. And if your boss is Hashem, and if your boss is speaking through Moshe, you're totally okay. You have nothing to worry about. As soon as the Jewish people realized that, that was the beginning of their teshuva, that is the beginning of their forgiveness for the sin of the golden calf. I promise you another Rabbeinu Bachai, so here we go. I keep my promises sometimes. All right, so Rabbeinu Bachai, this is uh, at the end of uh, chapter 39, 39-42. A similar comment. And th th that's why I, I, I kind of want to show you that there's a tradition to this comment. The Beit Halevi lived about 100 years ago, right? Uh, Rabbeinu Bachai lived, uh, you know, he was a student of... Uh, of the Ramban, so he lived a good 800 years ago or so, right? Kechol Hashem et Moshe, just everything that Hashem commanded Moshe, Kein Asu B'nei Yisrael et Kol Avoda. So do the Jewish people do all the work. Like I said, this phrase is repeated over and over again throughout the day. Beautiful. Says Rabbeinu Bachai, what is the word Kein doing over here? Kein Asu, so they did. So can means two different things in Hebrew. So just uh, the more popular use of the word can, like if you go to Israel now and somebody asks you something and your answer is can, what have you just said? Can means yes. Can means correct. In other words, says Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar, Haya Lomar, by using the word can, at kol ha all the work of al hakatuv kara, the melechat ha-mishkan avodat sha'asu ota, avodat Hashem barach ki inin hakatuv in shemot, in other words, the Jewish people did all that they had to do. We would have expected them. that They should have said, not The fact that the Torah uses the word implies that it was ken. It was the right thing to do. They did it correctly. The Pasuk is telling us in B'nai Yisrael, what they did was correct. Not only did they do what they were supposed to do, but they also had the same exact proper reasons for everything they did. They had the right kavana. They knew what they were doing and why they were doing it. 
It's one thing to do the right thing. It's another thing that you ha they had the right kavana. You need to know. All future generations need to know that when the Mishkan was built, it wasn't anything, nothing there was done by accident. Everybody was co totally concentrating and totally making it with all the right kavana. You know, when you make, when you bake um, matzah for Pesach, it's coming up already. I, I think the, the matzah bakery is already in full steam ahead, right? Well. You know that they're supposed to, when they roll the dough, etc., they're supposed to say, the shame mitzvah matzah. Either, I'm doing this for the sake of the matzah. You need to know that when you're eating mitzvah matzah, when you're eating shmura matzah, right, not machine made, but uh, but uh, handmade matzah, you ha you can be very confident that whoever was baking it somewhere along the way had the right intent for why that bread is made, why that matzah was made. That's a very important thing. It, it's that this mitzvah object isn't just a random you know thing. Uh, it wasn't just somebody like was just going to bake a cake and decided, ah, you know what. I'm not in the mood for cake. I'm going to make some matzah instead today. That's not what happened. The same thing with the Mishkan. There's no accidents in the Mishkan. Everything, every single part of the Mishkan was made with kavana, was made with the correct kavana, and everything was done exactly as it should have been done. That's something you need to know. That's why it says the word ken in this case. That's the Rabbeinu Bachaya, but then let's look at something his uh, his teacher, the Ramban, writes at the very, very end of the Parsha. By the way, I just noticed, I noticed, this is not intentional. These are, sometimes accidents happen unintentionally. Uh, they usually do. I just noticed that I don't have, this might be the first class where I don't have any quotes from Rashi. Now, this is in no way no way i i mean i'm i'm nobody would even say uh the, the, the premise of this point but uh this in it just it just happened that way in other words there's a, not, nothing wrong with rosh's commentary on the on the parsha uh it's uh, beautiful and very deep in lots of places definitely worth um definitely worth learning and i'm uh, I'm, I'm just uh, i'm just astounded i i, I thought that this this could never happen. That we could have a whole parsha class without a single Rashi, <laughs> but uh, that's what happened. Um, so anyway, all right. Um, let's see this uh, last Ramban, and then uh, let's see what he says here. This is uh, the Ramban, I guess, uh, chapter forty, verse twenty. Um, and and towards the uh, towards the middle of Shishi, the sixth Aliyah. Vikach viten et haidut el ha'aron. So this is Moshe already is putting together the Mishkan after everything's been brought to him. So he took and, and uh, the the edut, which is basically um, the tablets, right? The uh, the the luchot el. Aaron, he put, he brought it to the Aaron, to the Ark, yeah, uh, and he he put the poles in them, the badim, the, the the poles that were supposed to be put into the rings of the of the Aaron, al Aaron, v'ten et hakaporet, al Aaron milmala, and he, then he put the cover on top of the Aaron, the, the cover that has the the kruvim in it, uh, on it. So he put that on top. So he put basically put the luchot inside, put in the poles, put on the kruvim. Seems simple enough, right? Doesn't need any commentary. So we can go now, right? No. So the Ramban says this needs some explanation. He wants to know, the Ramban, where did Moshe take the luchot? So he placed the luchot, right? So what does that mean? Like during this whole time? Well, Before, where, yeah, where were they? Um, he he uh, put them in. Were, were they in like, uh, you know, on a closet, in a closet? Were they on a shelf? Which, you know, were I'm, they, no, was he holding them in his other hand while he was doing this? Like these are, these are the two luchot. Where did he get them from? It says, he says, it says, he got and put them. 
So where were they? So says the Ramban, very simply, this is probably the shortest Ramban you might ever see. He says that the he took them from the wooden Aaron, the wooden ark that was in Moshe's tent. Aaron H. Are you Sham Betoch Ohel Moshe? Now you're probably scratching your head wondering what's this Aaron H. What is this wooden Aaron we're talking about? So the heavy Otam Al Hamishka, and then he placed them into the Mishka. So to explain this, the Ramban has a few explanations to this, but over in uh, in Devarim, Sefer Devarim, chapter 10, where it talks about how Moshe came down from Har Sinai with the Luchot, it seems to imply then, Ramban says it's very explicit actually, that he placed them in a wooden box. He placed them in basically a, a closet, a traveling closet that was in his tent. Of course, that part that it's in his tent was not in the uh, uh, that that part was not in uh, was not in the Torah there, but uh, but what what was is that he uh, he put it in a wooden box. So how do we know that it was in his uh, that it, it was in Moshe's tent? So. The, uh, the there had to be somewhere to place. We had to have somewhere uh, of respect that uh, that that the Aaron that the Luchot would be kept in. So they had to have some sort of box or something. So that's an obvious assumption. But how do we know that it was an Aaron uh, Moshe's? Uh, there was in Moshe's. Oh hell, there was in Moshe's tent. This is also logical, because the Torah says that Hashem spoke to Moshe. From the Luchot, from, from wherever the Luchot were. And that must have been in his tent. It had to be somewhere. It definitely wasn't in the, in the Mishkan. The Mishkan wasn't built yet. And already Hashem is speaking to Moshe. So that, there was only one way that that could have happened. And the answer is, says the Ramban, it happened this way. It happened that, he, that in the, his own tent, in his own Ohel, Moshe kept a wooden box. And in the wooden box, was where the Luchot were until the Mishkan was finally built. And that's when he placed the, the Luchot where they belonged and where they would be forever and ever after in the, uh, in the Aron that, is, uh, that, is, that was in the Mishkan. Okay. Sorry, what happened to the box that Moshe had beforehand? I don't know. It doesn't say. We don't know where the box is? I mean, we don't know where other other things are, but like, I'm just wondering, was it reused for something? Like, recycled? No, it sh it should have been reused until it probably eventually fell apart. It's wood, so wooden things don't last very long. Um, I mean, not thousands of years usually. So it probably it disintegrated at some point, became unusable. Uh, but uh, it was probably kept in the uh, and it had it, it was a re very uh, respectable thing. So it should have probably been taken care of until it fell apart. Speaking of that, like we don't really know or not supposed to know uh, where the objects of the Mishkan, like by Semigdash, are anymore. Right. Okay. Right. We, I mean, we, we, we don't know. Uh, the Mishkan for sure. No, we, we, don't, we don't really know. Yeah. I mean, we'll 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 have we'll have these things when we need them. That's for sure. I mean, God willing, soon. All right. Thank you very much for uh, for joining you. us. Uh, you next so next next week's class is on Vayikra. God willing, start a new sefer. Chazak chazak. We need chazek. And the next Monday night's class is going to be on the laws of Purim. We don't usually oh. learn these laws, but there's quite a few of them, and worthy of review before uh, before we get uh, too caught up in other things. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, take thank care. you. Refresh your mother-in-law. Thank you. Take care.